Hello, everybody. My name is Jim Kling, and we're going to be talking about reconnecting and repairing damage that kids that have behavior disorders may create within the family. The important thing here is to remember that kids that have behavior problems can rip the very fabric of your family to shreds if we let it. And so we have to be careful about that. Usually by the time it gets to us, some of the damage has already been done. So what we want to do is we want to work on fixing that. And so we're going to go through a whole list of things that can be helpful. And at the end, we'll have some time for a few questions. And of course, if you have anything that you want to talk about, you can always give me a call or send me an email. That'll be listed at the, the back of this presentation. So let's get started. So the first thing you want to do is you want to start from scratch, which that begins with getting the house under control. Now, when we go into work with a uh, family, what we find is that we don't really start game nights and conversations, things like that, till at least we're about halfway through the program because you really have to make sure that you have some semblance of respect, you have some semblance of control, and then you're trying to build upon that. So if your house is in chaos and people are fighting, and there's a lot of yelling and screaming, probably not a good time to start the games, but you have to start somewhere. So if your situation isn't as bad, perhaps really interrelating to people, you can continue on this, this path of trying to connect everybody. But if you are struggling with issues, what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to try to get that fixed. And of course, if you're having problems, you can always give us a call and we can work on that. In the meantime, Let's work on trying to get these kids moving in the right direction. And there's really three things that kind of push people away. Kids that have anxiety, and it doesn't have to be the nervous kind of anxiety. It could be the, the idea that something doesn't sit right with them. They, they're, they're trying to control. They feel out of control. They're controlling everything, and it really pushes people away. It's kind of hard to manage a friend when the friend is always being demanding. And... It's even worse when it's family members. They could have some mood dysregulation issue that's causing them to have difficulties trying to, to manage their emotions. When they're frustrated, when they're upset, when there's issues that are starting to get out of control, then what we want to do is we want to be able to help them manage those moods. But this is going to assist that process because you can't always have negativity. You have to have moments where you can walk away saying, that was kind of fun. And if you don't have those moments, if it's always ending on a bad note, things are just going to, to deteriorate because what happens is it's like a spiral. It just keeps going down and down and down. So you want to end some of your interactions on a positive note. And hyperactivity. Hyperactivity is the inability to focus. A lot of impulsive stuff happens. And so people just can't stay in tune. And what we want to do is treat that like a a skill deficit where they just have to learn to be able to manage for longer and longer periods of time. So when we go through, we want to think of things as in, in the concept of skill sets. You can learn a lot from games, conversations, turn-taking, sportsmanship, flexibility. We do what we call follow the leader, which one child would say to whether it's a play date or to their siblings to say, what would you like to do? And whatever that person says, uh, barring some, let's rob a bank kind of things. Whatever that person says, we're going to go with that. And so it gives a chance for the other child to be able to, to open it up. And using that specific technique allows them to check off a box. Okay, I'm using a technique instead of feeling like nothing ever goes my way. They're actually trying to get other people involved. Parallel play. This is the concept where they're doing the same thing kind of next to each other. You see a lot of kids when they're playing video games, that they're not actually interacting, they're doing their own thing. Minecraft is a really good example of this. But we do that as well. You could be reading a book in the same room. They could be playing toys next to each other. They're not actually interacting with each other, but they're going in the same direction. And it's a good first step to be able to play next to somebody, but we want to move beyond that. Invitations, being able to invite somebody over to somebody's house and accepting the fact that they might get a rejection. They, oh, no, thank you. How do they handle that? 
you look at things through the eyes of the children, not just through our eyes, because you look at a sixth or an eighth grade dance and you're thinking, oh, how cute. But if you remember what that was like, every, all the, the kids would be against the walls and nobody would want to, to, to ask somebody to dance, especially not be the first person. Meeting people, friends, dating, all those things that were really difficult for kids when we we're growing up is going to be difficult for kids today. It's just we see things from a different light. Oh, just go ask them. Oh, just go do this. But it's really hard to go up to somebody and say, hey, would you like to be my friend? Because they're like, what? Stay away from me. You can't just say, you want my number or give me your number. You have to find some introduction, some way. And, and so what we want to do is we want to get to the point where they're learning how not just to make friends by being able to introduce themselves, but maintain that friendship. And making friends and maintaining friendships are two totally separate skills that have to be treated differently. So we're gonna go through how to maintain those relationships. Most people are able to, to, to go up to somebody, to talk to them, to be able to say, hi, my name's Jim, would you like to do something? Would you like to play? Um, do you mind if I sit here? Those types of things. Later on, um, in future workshops, we're going to talk more about making friends, but right now we're going to really focus on maintaining friends. So let's get ready. The first thing you have to know is your family dynamic. Obviously, you're going to need to know a number of family members, but what are their likes and dislikes? What are their personalities, right? So if you play a game like Trouble or Sorry or any type of an attack game, it might cause them to feel like they're being picked on and they whip the board across the room and now you got all these problems. And so you're going to want to start identifying where are they coming from? What can they handle? What can they not handle? What do they enjoy doing? If they really enjoy being on the Xbox or PlayStation or Wii, there are multiple things that you can play. There are, there are dance games. There are games to be able to um, to play Wii tennis, bowling, those those sports types of games. Those are all possibilities that, that they might be able to manage. But are we trying to develop skills here or are we trying to develop relationships? Because if we're trying to develop skills, then we're really going to target very specific games that we're going to talk about later, very specific activities that we're going to go into in depth. But if you're working on relationship building, you're going to want things that are going to be in, out, and over. You're going to want to, to make sure that everyone's playing something that is, is enjoyable because there are going to be things that some people just don't find all that fun. But that's okay because if they don't find it all that fun, what we're going to do is we're going to let them know that, hey, one time we're going to play this game, but the next time we'll play the other game. And there's going to be a lot of times where you're going to be working on both things, skill development and relationship building. So we're going to go into both of those, those situations. You want everyone to play if it's possible, even if you have super young kids. So if you're playing a game like, oh, Monopoly, or some of the basic ones like Sorry, those types of games, the child can roll the dice or the younger child can pick up the card. Now they might not be able to read the card, might not be able to participate, but in some way they're there and you want the family to be able to play when you can. Now, of course, you're going to need to pick the right times. You have to be in a good spot. If you're like, Oh, you know, I've got this headache. That's not the time to start it. So even though you said, Hey, look, we're going to do a Wednesday at seven o'clock. Don't continue Wednesday at seven o'clock. If you are not in a good space, you got to make sure that you're in a good space, knowing that it's a finite period of time, so you don't have to hold it together forever, but you do have to be in a good spot to be able to do this. And so if there is a show that everyone's watching, if there is a, a, an event that people are really focused on, like a football game, that's probably not the time to say, okay, let's have a game night. So you got to really kind of watch and pick and choose your timing. You also want to have an exit strategy. So if it does go bad, what are we going to do, right? And you're going to want to step down from the family game to a preferred activity. Let them have some, some video time or let, you know, everyone breaks for dessert or they can have some free time. You don't want to go right from a game to, okay, it's bedtime or you have to do your homework. 
don't go from a game night to a non-preferred activity. Try to find something that they can do that's enjoyable, even if it's not for a long period of time. We also want to watch the time frames. So I put down a few time frames that that has really worked with the families that I've worked with, and knowing your own child, knowing your own family, these times are going to fluctuate. But if you're going to have a conversation, try to keep keep the conversations to a shorter time frame, but more frequent, right? And that's what you're going to hear this whole time. Frequency over duration. Small times where everyone can be in, be out, and be done is going to be a lot better than trying to get one big game, one Monopoly game that's going to last for three hours that everyone's going to walk away hating because you're trying to make up for time lost. And this is kind of like brushing your teeth like for you know 20 minutes straight because you know you're going to the dentist tomorrow. It's better to kind of brush them all through those six months in between your dentist appointments so when you do go, you're in a much better spot. And the games are about accumulation. You're going to accumulate over time to make sure that people are in a good spot. So if you're doing a family game night, we, we usually start at 15 minutes. And if people are already into games or they start to be able to manage it, you can move up to around 90 minutes. Of course, depending on your family, that might go a lot, um, a lot longer. But generally speaking, in that time frame is going to keep you in the best possible spot. Also, we recommend a couple times a week. So see it as almost like a therapy appointment. You just want to make sure that you're having time. So when you look back on things and you say, how did the week go? Well, we did those, those games. That was kind of fun. And it kind of cements, it roots a moment in time where you can go back and saying, yes, that was enjoyable. Now, play dates, you're going to go a little longer because it does take time to get there. You don't want to just turn it around too fast. So you're looking at about 30 minutes to two hours. Again, start on the shorter ends first. You can always expand it out. But within those, those play dates, you're really going to want to have a set of skills. Again, some of these skills we're going to be talking about later. But you want to make sure that they have a set of skills because you don't want them just to free associate or just free play the entire time because it will turn bad, most likely. Turn into arguments, fights, or you'll have one kid that is is bored and they just walk, especially if it's your own child, they'll just walk away or they'll just do something in their own house. And now you're entertaining this playmate that you're like, hey, aren't you supposed to be interacting with them? And they're like, I'm done. So you don't want to end these things on a bad note. So have activities, have events that that can make the play date structured throughout the time, and then it has an ending point. Again, watch that exit strategy. Parent and sibling visitations. Unless you're comfortable doing this, unless it's been you've been having success, I don't suggest starting with overnights. Start out with some some day visits. Make sure that people are going through and having the um, the sessions where. Again, it's structured. You have a game that's not going to absorb the entire time, but you have a conversation, you have a game, you have maybe um, something to eat or drink, and you're breaking everything up into chunks. So by the time you get through the time, everything's going well. And some of those chunks might be completing homework assignments, um, working on schoolwork, any of those types of things you can really fill it in, but you're going to want to make sure that you have fun. And so that's what we're going to be talking about is, it's just having fun. So what are, what are we going to do here? So you want to try to start where they're at. So if they have interests already, if they have favorite movies, if the music, whatever it is that they're doing, start there. Don't try to introduce something that is completely foreign to them where they're just not going to be able to handle it. See where their interests are at. But I also tell people to be forgiving. My son, probably like a lot of your kids, are watching other kids play games. And you're like, well, why don't you just play the game yourself? But he enjoys watching other people kind of do this narration and playing games. And I was in Seattle a couple of years back, and I noticed a bunch of people that were going to an event. And I'm like, hey, what are you guys doing? 
and they're going to a gaming convention. I'm like, oh, do you guys play games? And they're like, no, we watch people play games. And they treat it like a sporting event where you go and you watch people battle it out on you know, Xbox or whatever they happen, the system that they're using. And some of these prizes are astronomically high. And it's, they're selling out stadiums. So this isn't just your child. This is an event that is happening. And sometimes for older people, we're like, I can't understand why you'd want to watch somebody play a game. But we watch football. We watch baseball. We watch other people play games. Is it really all that dissimilar? If you look at back at some of the shows that you used to watch, maybe Friends or Seinfeld, Three's Company, Brady Bunch, depending on how old you are. If you look back at those now and you say, hmm, that for some reason it was really funny then, but it's not now. That's what's happening is that that times are changing. And as they become adults, they're going to look back on their experiences and be like, oh, it seemed fun at the time, but they don't really understand why it was so funny at that time. So you can't be able to, to push wisdom into the child. And wisdom is only granted by experience. And so they're going to have to live their childhood the way it is. But we're going to try to make it more interactive to include us, to include family members, friends, because you don't want to be their playmates the entire time. You want them to have friends. So really, we got to look at a few things. Conversations. Can we talk to them? Can we connect with them? Music can pull people together. You can have dance parties. You can find out their interests. If they're listening to something that you absolutely can't stand, try to understand from their point of view, what is it that makes this so interesting? Now, there are some things you may just say, I can't allow to have, like explicit lyrics and things like that. You can certainly have rules, but don't necessarily ban all the music to the point where it's only what you want to listen to. You don't want to do one of these footloose maneuvers where you are just trying to, to stop all types of activities that you can't agree to. So if it's, again, explicit lyrics, things that you find that are damaging, hurtful, harmful, certainly you can limit those. Other than that, try to get a feel for where they're at. We're going to talk about structured activities. Not everything has to be a game. It could be a project or a task. But then when you do get to playing, how, what is the difference between free play and structured play? How do you identify that, that this is going to be a game that we're all going to be able to involve because it has a set of rules versus we're just going to play, right? Whether with dolls or toys or something like that. That can be equally fun but sometimes it's a little harder for adults. So we're going to give you some strategies about how to make that work for you. All right, so let's start with conversations. Conversations are something that we encourage all of our families to do. We usually limit the time to about 10 minutes. Now, 10 minutes is usually the maximum amount of time. You can do it shorter. You can do one interchange, right? They ask a question, you ask a question, and it's, and it's the end. But you want to make sure that you're limiting the time. Because if you have one of those one, two, three hour deep discussions where you're really getting to the heart of hearts of how things are going and where they're at, those are fantastic to have. And if you can get those, that is wonderful. The problem is, is that the next time you go to talk to them, you're like, hey, let's talk. And they're like, oh, I just can't. I don't have it in me. It's just too much because I don't have the emotional wherewithal to keep on bringing that up to the table. So you, remember, don't seek all of that emotional energy in one sitting. Try to spread it out. Try to have time where the next time you can be like, oh, yeah, I'd be happy to talk. And these conversations will add up. So at first, it'll, it'll start a little awkward. It'll start a little artificial. But June will get here, October, February the calendar will continue to turn. And as it turns, all those conversations start to build. And that building, that crescendo is your relationship. Because at first it's going to just, like I said, start out artificial, but they might s sneak in a little question like, have you ever been bullied? And you're like, Whoop, are we talking about, are you being bullied? Hold off on interrogating them. If they're asking you a question, answer their question as honestly as possible. Now, if they're asking you some things, that you just don't want to talk about, you know, what did you do in college? Did you experiment with drugs things? and you just didn't feel comfortable? You can decline to answer, but talk about other people's experiences. Say, I'm not really comfortable talking about that, but I will tell you 
that I've seen other people have difficulties. And let me tell you about what I've heard. Outside of feeling uncomfortable about talking about those situations, give them an honest answer. Now, afterwards, you can go and do your research and call the school social worker and say, check to see if he's being bullied. But you still want to make sure that you're answering that question. And if you're uncomfortable, this is a great opportunity if you do have a therapist to, to kind of process through them and say, this is kind of what we talked about. What do you think? Without necessarily disclosing everything. Topics can range anywhere from just interests, just things that, that you are, are, are chatting about, which could be existential. If you're a tree, what kind of tree would you be? Could be hypothetical. If you had a superpower, what would that superpower be? It could be quizzical. If you put coffee in a thermos that keeps the coffee hot, if you put Kool-Aid in the thermos, the thermos keeps it cold. How does the thermos know to keep one thing hot, one thing cold? And you're like, hmm, well, it does know. Right. And you kind of get that those brain cells firing and trying to get them to to understand that, hey, this is this is something that we can problem solve together. And so you can do those fun kind of topics all the way to things like family history. What what about your parents and your parents, parents and your parents, parents, parents? Right. What does it mean to be a part of this family? Remember, you should be talking about half the time. So you should be asking questions. They should be asking questions as long as you follow two rules. The first rule is don't lecture them. Don't tell them, hey, look, you need to get better at grades. You need to, to tighten this area up. Those might be conversations you need, but not in these kind of structured conversations where it's going to go back and forth. But conversely, you don't want them to be asking you for things. Don't want them to be saying, hey, look, can I get this or can I have that? That's not what these conversations are about. It's just about connecting us. Now, if you start to get really good at it, you could try conversation via phone, especially if you travel. Hey, you know, can, can I talk to your mom? Can I talk to your dad? Instead of going right to the other adults, just say, hey, why don't we talk a little bit? And again, it should go back and forth, back and forth. So, so ask a question, have an answer. But don't have just a single world answer to expand on it. I don't care how closed the question is. They could say, what time is it? And instead of just saying, oh, it's 12 o'clock. Oh, it's 3 o'clock. Instead of just giving them a direct answer, just say, hey, look, I can look at the clock and say, hmm, it looks like it's 1230. But let me tell you something. It used to be more difficult. I used to have to be a lot more analog clocks. And then you'd have to kind of look at where the big hand is and all that. Talk a little bit more about the answer than just answering the question. What's your favorite color? Mine happens to be purple. Now I could easily just say purple or I could say it used to be blue because I like large bodies of water and skies and, and it's really soothing. But as I got older, I kind of mellowed out and it kind of moved to more of a purple color. Have a little bit of a story, but a story has to have a beginning, a middle and an end. Don't have a beginning, a middle, a middle, a middle. Have an end to your story and then kick it back to them. Don't ask the exact same question. So if you ask me what color was my favorite color, and I talked about purple and how I liked blue, I can turn that into kind of a geographical question. Oh, if, you know, if you could live anywhere else, right? If you can live on the ocean, um, which country would you pick? Or where would you like to be in southern and northern end? And toss it to them and let it go back and forth, back and forth. You just don't want to repeat the same questions over and over. Let's talk about activities. It doesn't have to be games. Now, we're going to spend some time talking about games, but it doesn't have to be just games. Puzzles can be a fantastic opportunity to sit um, with a, individually, in pairs, in a group, where everyone's just kind of putting the puzzle pieces together. Now, there are things like puzzle mats that you can do on, and just roll them up or you can have a table that's dedicated just to the puzzle, but being able to just put the pieces in and, and share and say, oh, pass me that piece over there, it can be interactive in a low key kind of way. So a puzzle is a great opportunity to bond with people in a low intensity activity, and you'd be surprised. I've seen some kids, most of us kind of do the edges of a puzzle, but I've seen some kids they actually work from the inside out. And you're like, how does your brain work? And it's just interesting to watch other people, how they find different ways of solving problems. Reading. 
Some people are avid readers and, and even the kids just are devouring books. Have a book club. Everyone reads a chapter. Everyone reads a book. Everyone reads a section. You can do this even with young kids. You know, they just read, <coughs> excuse me, they just read a, a small section in a, in uh, a paragraph. Hey, what did you read? This is what I read into it. And you can kind of talk about it and being able to get some insight into books. You don't have to be an adult to have a book club. Just make sure that you're picking books that's, that are age appropriate and that everyone's enjoying. So you might need to watch your topics. If you want to do a movie, that's certainly a structured activity, but do a movie in a chat afterwards. Oftentimes when we talk with older kids and young adults, we encourage them never go, if you're going on a first date, you don't want to do a, a dinner in a movie. You want to do a movie in a dinner because at dinner you have nothing to talk about. And in the movie, you're not talking at all. Watch the movie first and then talk afterwards. And it works the same thing for families. Watch the movie first and then talk about what they got out of the movie, what they got out of the play. Uh, there's a lot of plays, especially if you're in the Chicagoland area, but there's a lot of plays out there that range from either eighth grade high school type plays to professional uh, Broadway or off-Broadway type events. Those can be riveting as well. But you might want to start out with a movie, especially matinee, something like that see how it goes, find an interest that everyone has, and then talk a little bit about it. And that once again, it's not just about you try to find their interests as well. So, so pick movies that is going to have a value to everybody. So you might want to move towards an Aquaman versus the Bohemian Rhapsody, unless everyone is able to be able to manage that. Projects, arts, crafts, all of these things can be can be great you can you can bake make cookies you can make activities that that revolve around baking or cooking and then turning it into something if you want to be super creative you can have a dinner night let them cook the meal or let them be a part of that and then they can invite the families in, the family in and everyone dresses up or they can invite people outside of the family right friends and that hey come on over for this dinner party and you can really turn it into a formal event, or it could just be, hey, let's have tacos. And then everyone gets to thank the, the chefs for going through and doing that, and people can take turns. And hopefully you might find that if you get enough people that enjoy that event, that they bond during the actual cooking process itself. DJ dance parties, we talked about uh, just having music, finding out the music they like, and just being silly just dancing there's also the ability to make youtube videos you remember we talked about kids that are watching other kids do these things you can make a youtube video you can uplink it and it can be public or private it doesn't have to go to everybody it could just be to a select number of people or you could just have it for yourselves but to be able to do something and then the broadcast it even though the only people that might see it are friends and family that could be a lot of fun and you could do it like a news report you can do it in any way that you find is going to draw the interest of the family members. I went on a cruise ship one time, and those that have been on a cruise ship, they have usually kind of the, the entertainment director. They go through and they just sit with somebody else, and they're just chatting, right? They're just interviewing back and forth. But somehow it's riveting, right? It's just watching somebody else kind of talk can be riveting as long as it doesn't go on and on and on. So try to keep it manageable in time frame. Talk about things that might interest other people. And a lot of things that interest you will interest other people. So don't worry so much about making sure that this is going to be the best presentation ever. Just have a lot of fun with it. All right. So now let's talk a little bit more about play. So free play is usually toys, dolls, houses. You know, when you're playing the house, uh, somebody can be the parent, somebody can be the child. This is a great time for role reversals too. And so when they're playing the parent and they ask you to do something, you're like, I don't want to, I don't want to. And see how they would get you to do it and say these, you can kind of start giving them a, an understanding that it's not so easy just to be the parent, right? It's, 
What do you do when they don't do it? And you might be surprised how much they reflect in what you do. When my son was really young, he would walk around the room and said, I said no, I said no. And I'm like, is that what I say? My wife's like, yeah, that's pretty much what you say. And I'm like, oh, well, I got to watch that, right? Because they reflect what it is that you do. And so when you're saying, I said no, don't do that. And they start saying, I said no, you got to ask yourself, is that the message I really want to send? And it might be, but you really want to watch how they are acting and imitating because that's going to tell you a lot of things about your own style. Encourage imagination, stories. This is where you can, um, for younger kids, you can play with a tea set. Um, but even for older kids, you could, you can act out characters. You can, um, you can do superheroes, any of those types of things, anything that encourages imagination, stories, anything that, that is moving you forward. Just understand that you're going to want to go with the flow. When I used to work with kids that, that had troubled upbringings and they'd never really learned how to play, they'd be moving the cars and then they'd just crash into each other or they'd go back and forth and wing it across the room or they would carry the dolls by their, their hair. And you'd have to say, no, no, you want to do this. And you kind of rock them or you go beep, beep coming through. And then they move their car around and you can actually teach a lot of these these skill sets just through playing. How does one play? Just remember that it's not going to go exactly as planned. And that's not what free play is about. It's about to go in any direction that it happens to go as long as it's appropriate. So as an adult, you're going to have to tap into your childhood. I was just talking to another family and I happened to be at Toys R Us just before they went under. And I was so excited to go to Toys R Us because I'm like, oh, I used to love this place. And then then as an adult, I went in and I'm like, ah, I don't remember the fascination I had with all the little toys that I was playing with before. Even though now I could buy essentially anything I wanted in the store, I really had no desire. And when you're playing with kids, you're not going to have a desire. But again, it's their desire. And so you got to tap into that. So whether it's an older kid where you're making a YouTube video or you're trying to just um, have a stand-up comedy uh, event where everyone kind of takes the mic or karaoke, or you're playing with cars and that, just go with the flow. I tell people a stick, a box, and a rock. Those are the three things that any child should be able to have access to and make an entire day out of it. A stick could be a wand, it could be a sword, it could be a uh, diviner looking for water, you know, a box could be a house, a race car, a spaceship, you know, a rock can skip rocks. It can be as a baseball. Obviously, you're going to want to be careful that you don't allow your child to take the stick and start hitting it, the rock in the house and do it with reason. But there's a lot that can be done with just the stuff that you look around. A lot of these toys, a lot of these, these items that that we get they're so specific the dolls are so creative the the um they're able to talk to you 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 find that these toys that that are absolutely perfect in every way actually loses out the imagination that's why people enjoy books over movies because movies give you the image the book allows you to present your own image and when you free play with toys that aren't not necessarily designed as toys you get a refrigerator box and you can make anything you want out of that and the fun is in your brain along with the people that you're doing it with so so i really encourage free play i really encourage to try to to go about enjoying the moment don't go into that toys or rust store don't go into that that toy store and think wow there's i don't understand why this was so fun Instead, try to tap in and say, ooh, what could I do with this? And bring your own childhood back, and it will really blossom into the others. But we do get into structured play now. Now, structured play is usually games. It doesn't have to be, but it's usually games. And we're going to spend actually a little bit of time talking about this. So there are different types of structured play that you want to look at. 
And so let's look at the games themselves. A lot of competitive games, these are you races to the finish, things that you start with and somebody has to make it to the end, right? You don't necessarily interact with other people, but you are trying to go against the other person. So things like Candyland and the game of life, shoots and ladders, those types of things will move you into a direction. Now, I oftentimes tell people, don't play games like shoots and ladders because nobody ever wants to go down the chute. So you're going up the ladder and you're getting close and you're getting close. And when you go down the chute, you're like, oh, I can't handle this. And it takes forever to go through. And the frustration, the disappointment oftentimes can be a bit overwhelming, even for adults. So, so things like Candyland that can move you forward that um, that even if you get a special card where it goes back, you can have special rules that say you can only move forward. and Or you can even take the specials out. And so now the colors only allow you to move forward. Or you could take out the singles. And so now you're going to double colors each and every time. There are ways that you can to use house rules, which we're going to talk about later, that can take the game and really focus on what you're trying to do is, is to get through this, is to be able to identify certain things, not necessarily deal with all the frustrations and heartaches that can come with it. And then when you get to the end, it's not over until everyone gets through. So they keep rolling, they keep taking colors until everyone gets there and then we all win. So you can turn it into a romper room style of game where everyone actually wins instead of saying, I won in your face, booyah, I beat a seven-year-old. That's really not what we're trying to do. We're not trying to, to push it in there. Although there is nothing wrong with being competitive, just remember to watch your audience. You want to make sure that you understand who it is that you're dealing with, because if they can't handle frustration, this might not be the game for you. Attack games. Now, attack games, these are typically for slightly older kids. Uh, these games are like sorry, trouble, where you're actually going at somebody, right? And so not only are you trying to race to the end, but you can knock somebody out. You could um, you can take over them, right? Like risk is a matter of just being able to absorb everybody. So you want to be careful because once again, people have a hard time being able to deal with this. And if they if they become upset easily, you're going to find that the board's going to go flying and nobody's going to have fun, right? Because it's great when they're winning, but they can't handle losing. So this is something you can move towards, but maybe not start out with. But if they can't handle the loss of something, if they can't handle what's going on, then keep things moving forward. Just remember that some games are going to be a little tricky because like in Sorry, you have to pull a one or a two or a trouble, you have to pop out a certain number in order to get out of that, that start mode. Let any number go through. You can make a house rule. Just make a house rule for everybody. Don't make a house rule just for some people. I need a one or a two, but you can pull any card. That's not really what you want to do. You want to make sure that you're making the rules so general that anybody can apply that rule. And so nobody really has an advantage or disadvantage in that because otherwise people are going to feel cheated or they're going to be more demanding. So make the rule for everybody. And once again, you can do it. So what happens is that everyone's winning at the same time. So you just keep allowing it to keep going until they move all the way through. These are little trickier games for little older kids, but they can be a lot of fun and they can handle frustration. Coincidentally, though, the person that can't handle the frustration, never pops the one or two. The person that can't handle it, they end up, somebody lands on them and then another person lands on them and they feel like they're being ganged up upon. So sometimes you're going to have to adjust your strategy to make sure that we're evening it out a little. As they get more sophisticated in their play, you can be more aggressive in your strategies. But remember for us as the adults, we're not necessarily trying to win or lose. We're trying to make the game enjoyable. That doesn't mean lose on purpose, but it also doesn't mean crushing your opponent. You have to be reasonable with that. All right, so what's next? Attrition games. These games take a little longer to do, but what happens is that they're trying to pull the resources and eventually they will end up winning by default. 
So war is about collecting all the cards. Monopoly is about you running out of cash. Ticket to Ride is a is a great railroad type of game, but you're trying to block people and you're trying to acquire enough points. And when people can't get all their, their pieces on the board, it really allows for a lot of interaction. It allows for more interventions between players and more strategy, but it does take a little longer. And once again, some kids aren't going to be able to handle this, especially for the length of time. So you're really going to want to make sure that you're dealing with a slightly older child. Um, usually teenagers are really good for this if they can already manage it. But you might have some kids that that are really able to, to manage these types of the games at an early age. Impulsive, hyperactive kids, kids that can't focus. You might find that longer games just aren't for them. However, we've been talking about a lot of attack and attrition and wearing them down, but there are cooperative games. Now, cooperative games can be remarkably effective, but they're a little bit complex to begin with, right? So now you're once again looking at, at older kids, but there's games like Pandemic or Forbidden Island, things where it's the group. You win as a group or you lose as a group and you're playing against the game itself. So you see a lot of this on video games where you're trying to overcome an obstacle and things like that, where you might have two guys that are trying to, to beat whoever it is, the big bad guy. And, and a lot of video games now, especially the online stuff, people are working in groups. And that's what's really moving people forward is that's, that's why you find kids that are really into Xbox, they're really into PlayStation, because what they're trying to do is they're trying to work together to overcome something. And that can be a great bonding experience. It is a little difficult to set up. It's a, the difficulty factor increases. And if somebody is doing something that is not what the other people want, it can provide some interpersonal squabbles. It can, it can really pull people down. But it can be a wonderful bonding experience. You do have to watch for one person being extremely good at the game and everyone else not because then everyone else is just riding the person's coattails since one person really dictating the entire event. However, Everyone's skill level will start to rise. And although even if it starts out that way, that's okay because as people start to get better at it, and the games are always changing, even the same game, depending on the cards you draw, it's usually there's a, there's a, a rotation of uh, the same game has many different variables. So don't worry so much about one person's just so much better. Everyone else's skills will start to bring up as long as that we can handle the fact that they got the setup down, that they're understanding what it is that they're doing and that they're working together and not to kind of be hard on the person that oops and did something that the group didn't necessarily like. If you do get diff you know, find it difficult to get it started, a lot of these games have short demo videos. Just Google them up. Just almost every, especially all the new games they have, they have, you know, five or 10, 15 minutes tops of watching the game interaction, the setup, all that. That way, instead of just trying to read the rules, you get a good understanding of what's actually happening here. All right. Now there are hybrid games. These are games that take the best of each style, but they all come with similar drawbacks. Um, these are like Uno, Exploding Kittens, Timeline Spotted. All these things, they're quick. And that's really what their advantage is. They're in, they're out. It's over. And if somebody gets knocked out, the turnaround time is relatively quick. And again, you can modify these. So if you're playing Uno, instead of seven cards, play with five cards or three cards. You can keep the game shorter. And then if somebody's out, don't wait until everyone plays it out. Okay, that person won. Let's turn around, play again. And so everyone has a chance to keep on getting in, getting in, getting in. Just remember that these kind of games can be difficult because if the same person is always losing, this might be difficult for them to, to handle. But when you look at how these play, a lot of it is just luck. So some things like spot it, which requires the ability to recognize something, could be difficult. And so if you, if you allow somebody that is younger, that 
never is spotting it quick enough, you can always give them a slight advantage. So this goes away from the rule of saying uh, house rules for everybody. If you want to even things out, you can say when we flip this over, because it's kind of a memory of recognizing, you get an extra five seconds before we look. And so they can look for five seconds and then you go up. And if it starts to even out, great. Otherwise, you can move a little higher, a little lower in that time frame. So, so watch for these games because the, the strategy is not all that complex. A lot of it is luck. But again, the turnover is fast. And that's what we're looking for. In, out, over. Everyone walks away saying, that was pretty good. Now, there are interactive games. Um, that's that can go relatively fast usually you need a bit of a group these are like uh, werewolves heads up um this is ellen DeGeneres did a little um sponsored a, a game that essentially you have something on your head and then everyone else is trying to do charades and if you guess what it is then you say oh it's folding laundry and then you'd flip it up and you'd get a point for that now these are interactive games, but the nice thing is that everyone wins this in some level because if I get the most points because I guessed the clues, that's because you did a great job of giving me great clues. And so we all win together. Now, usually these are break, breaking down into teams and, and you want to be careful to make sure that you're watching those teams. You know, be judicious when you're setting up teams. Don't always put the boys versus the girls or the adults versus the kids mix it up remembering the whole point is that that there should be a fair dis distribution about who's winning and who's losing and if somebody is always dominating you're going to, want to change that up just slightly non-board games now non-board games this would include non-traditional games right so hide and go seek um sardines is an absolutely fantastic one this is essentially hide and go seek but when you find them, you kind of slide up next to them and then two people are hiding. And then when the next person finds them, the three people are hiding. It's really hard not to laugh. And the last person that finds everybody, they're going to find a whole group of people kind of huddled together. Um, and so it's not about the first person who finds it. It's about the last person that finds it. Um, but we talked about wee bowling. Scavenger hunts are fantastic. A lot of these are icebreakers in 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 events like if you went to uh, a party those icebreakers can be absolutely just as much fun during your own individual game nights with that family so trivias uh, charades anything that can can be relatively dynamic that's that's going to be well within a group keeping in mind that you're going to want to be careful about having heated discussions, hurt feelings, because sometimes when there is a, a conversation that goes back and forth, sometimes people can use hurtful words. And so we're going to go back to, and we're going to kind of end soon with exit strategies. Just watch for that. Um, so making sure that whether it's, it's non-board games or any types of games that you don't find people are just being abusive and hurtful without it being addressed. All right. So role-playing games now this one i gotta tell you is i is near and dear to my heart because i used to to play when i was younger role-playing games and at some level i still do but these interactive games can be extremely helpful by evoking imaginations so the most traditional type one of the first ones is called dungeons and dragons but it doesn't have to be fantasy. It can be science fiction, mysteries, murder mysteries, superheroes, whatever it happens to be. But essentially you are, you have a book or a set of books that give you a series of rules to follow from. And one person that is the GM or the dungeon master or the game master, um, also known as a GM or DM, they, they essentially set a stage. They, they tell a story. And a lot of these stories can be right out of, out of, materials that you can buy so you can buy these stories these episodes and so what ends up happening is one person tells a story they're like a director of a play and everyone else is a character and they act out the character so if, if they had a character that was that was a really good person even though you might want to do something that's not so good you encourage them hey look you want to really kind of play this good character so you're playing things not just how you would do it but how the character would do it 
And so they would solve stories, they would solve events, they would solve things. And as they made those, uh, those scenarios complete, as they finished those episodes, what we find is that they would get experience. Their, their character would improve. So they, there's an investment, there, there's a growth to that process. A lot of therapy groups are starting to do this. They're trying to work these within therapy because it does allow for things like problem solving, social skills, how to work things out, even following rules and directions. So this is something that you might want to consider if you have people that have interests, right? Now, this is not to be confused with live action kind of um, uh, like medieval times where people dress up in costumes, although some people do that. Generally speaking, that's a different style. This is actually a game system that you're kind of following through. So this is something that that I've seen families that have done together. And the, the parents can take the role of that, that, that dungeon master. They can take the role of that director, but also for slightly older kids, they can also share that role or even give up that role and allows for the for the child who may be controlling to be able to feel like they're they're in control remembering that if they abuse that control people could just say i don't want to play anymore and so the gm has has a requirement to try to make the the other participants enjoy themselves and so if they're not enjoying themselves the the natural course of action would be people are going to pull away and they're going to struggle with that. Now you're going to see some personal favorites. I'm not going to go through these personal favorites, but some of the things that I have enjoyed in the past. Now I put a little asterisk by the ones that I think those as professionals that want to do quick bonding experiences, they might enjoy. But as you go through this, um, some of these I've done with my, my children. And so they're a little smaller. But uh, but some of these games can just be for uh, just about everybody. And even the, the younger games I find actually quite enjoyable. All right. So a couple final points. For advanced players, you can bring in bigger groups. Um, you can get people that's, that come in and you can have tables. that. And so if you can get other people that are involved, maybe a bunch of friends, if you have kids that are the same age and they have other friends, some kids are relatively popular. They can bring in, you can have different stations. So somebody can be playing Uno at one station and a role-playing game at a different station. And then you can rotate or if somebody gets knocked out or they have an interest. It's, it's nice because it keeps people focused. It gives people something to do. And you can have a little something for everybody. You can also use a leaderboard. And so this is about trying to keep track of how things are going. So maybe you guys are playing foosball or you're playing Wii bowling or something like that. And you can say, okay, let's have not necessarily teams, although you could do teams, you can also do individuals. Where did you rank and kind of have an elimination series and maybe having prizes at the end, but make sure that the prizes are all about the equivalent. And it's really more of the, the, the privilege of saying, hey, I won this one with the understanding that you can do a different one. And it can be for ping pong. It can be just about everything you want to do. House rules are absolutely encouraged. These are the rules that deviate from the actual rules themselves, but you want to make sure that it's helping you. So there's one game that was called Nonviolent Politically Correct War. And essentially it's a game of war, but every time you would get war, you would tie, you would take the remaining stack and you'd switch them. So this could make people go from winning the game because I have a lot of cards to really quickly losing and back and forth. And you get these big swings in that. You can apply those kind of rules to just about anything that you want. As long as everyone agrees to the rules, they understand what's going on and you want to make sure that it goes fast, right? You want it to, to be able to, to don't get bogged down by what does the rule say? Just make a ruling, just say, this is how we're going to play. And that moves on instead of going through and trying to read through the actual rules themselves. Some helpful hints for just about everybody is balloons. Always have balloons on hand, right? If in a pinch, everybody likes to play with balloons. When you toss a balloon out there, whether it's in a party, whether it's in a theater, whether it's in your home, everyone's going to want to knock it up. And that's okay. That can be fun. Um, we talk about like 
you know, playing volleyball games with your with your feet, right? Um, so you can have a lot of fun with balloons. You can have a couple of them going at the same time. You can make games up. And that's going back to that free play. Just kind of come up with things on the fly and, and let them change the rules and all that. As long as they're changing rules, not just so they win, but it's 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 kind of a flowing where, oh, let's do this. Or let's now have, it can't touch the floor anymore. Or it's, um, you can only hit it twice. And as those rules start to come up, then you guys can have a lot of fun. When playing with smaller children, like I said, allow them to roll the dice, draw a card, move the piece. Even though they're not necessarily playing, they're helping, they're interacting. <coughs> this could be a wonderful time to, to keep them engaged. Know your crowd. Be judicious when you're picking the games. Be prepared for a quick exit, right? So, all right, let's all go in and get some ice cream. And you have a, a moment and now we're done let's go do something else and you're transitioning back into the home having that exit strategy is going to be crucial if it does go bad and it could if it goes bad the game is over do not put it on pause the game is over put it away because what will happen is you'll get somebody ruminating about it and they want to keep playing and they want to keep pulling it back out and why can't we finish? And other people are like, I'm not interested. And now you have this big battle. It's over. If it has to be stopped, put it away, unless it's being stopped on, on the grounds that, okay, we're going to do this over a period of time. And we see this for games like Risk or Monopoly and things like that. We're going to leave the table set up, even a puzzle. We're going to leave it set up and that's we'll come back to it at a different time and then at a prepared time you guys come back and play another round in this way you can have longer games that is able to to stand the test of time just be aware that if it's not secured you know it could be moved it can, people can knock things over and you're just going to put it away anyway so make sure it's in a secured spot Disruptive behaviors at school, IEPs, BIPs, which are behavior intervention plans, 504 plans. This is what we're going to talk about next month. So right now we're trying to establish within the family, making sure that this is a, we're growing, we're being secure, we're making sure that our relationships are going in the right direction. It's always trending, but we don't have as much effect at school as we can within our own home. So how do we influence that? How do we go to these IEPs? How do we, how do we go to these schools and saying, Hey, look, I want to be an educated consumer. And so you really want to make sure that people are, are, are able to go to the table and not be intimidated. Right? So when you got a parent or two parents and they're sitting there and there's 12 people telling them, this is what's going on. Just remember that they are the school professionals, but nobody is going to know your kid better than you. So we're going to make sure that we get you some good information so you can go in and feel like you can have a plan. You can be an active participant. Now, there were a couple of questions that kind of popped up as we went over. And so I just want to talk a little bit about that. And so the first one is, can we play poker? So this is actually kind of a common one. You know, people, enjoy the, the game of poker, blackjack, all those types of things. They're just card games. Now, oftentimes they're associated with gambling, but they certainly don't have to be about gambling. And yes, you can absolutely play with those. And you can use chips if you want to have some, some way of interacting. There's a game called Left Right Center, which is, is, uh, is a real quick game, but it doesn't end until all the chips are in the pot, essentially. So the second question, the follow-up question was, can we use actual money? Yes, you can. But you want to be careful that you're not using money to try to encourage them to play. So don't play with $10, $20, $50 things. So when people win, they're like, oh, this was so much fun. Because one person's going to say this was so much fun. And everyone else is going to feel so cheated, so slighted. So remember, all the prizes should be about the same value if you are putting out prizes. Otherwise, just put pennies out put potato chips, pretzels, um, actual poker chips, any of those types of things you can certainly use in order to, um, to allow the, the way of keeping score really is what it's, it's coming down and the privilege of saying, yes, I won with the understanding that we'll play again. And that's the key is that frequent games, interactions, 
play conversations are much better than having one really long one. The other one that I'm getting here is trying to get my child to therapy when they refuse. Now, we're not really going to go over that in this workshop, but I will tell you that, that usually as a quip, we tell people, you can do a game night two times a week for about 15 minutes, or you can go to family therapy for about an hour a week. You're getting about the same value. Now, that's not totally true, but the reality is, is that this is therapy in the sense that it is extremely therapeutic. So therapy doesn't necessarily have to be with a therapist sitting in a room talking about your feelings. Lots of things can be therapeutic. And so be careful about saying, we need therapy, we need therapy, we need therapy. That is an extremely important part of a lot of people's plans to make their family healthy, and it can be absolutely life-changing. But just remember that you can't rely on other people doing all of your work. So I want you to spend some time. I want you to focus on making sure that you guys are enjoying each other's company and that you guys are having the best family possible. Thank you very much. And if you do have questions or you want to talk a little bit about things, you can always email us, give us a, uh, a phone call. We can, we, can, we can talk through just about every issue. Just remember, this is always about trying to make the family move forward. So I want to thank everybody for coming out. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. Otherwise, you go out and go have fun. Thank you very much for listening, and we'll talk soon. Bye-bye.